This isn't so much a uh, sexting tutorial, <laughs> though, though it has application. We live in a lovely time in which photography is sort of in everyone's pocket, and we can engage the muses uh, with our cell phones. So the idea being that you, would, you were a photographer or you're an artist before, during, and after the act of creation. And, and the first step would be to, may, to bring a kind of unity between your desire and your intention and then and if should there be people involved, the permission to, to have their photograph made. My own personal work sort of runs the gamut from of sex and celebrity to, to actual celebrity. I guess what where I'm where I'm always being attentive is to when, when even if it's iconic superheroes, there's still sort of this medieval trope at play as well. Right, to, to just sitting on a bus on the, on the way to nowhere with your cell phone. The, there isn't a real distinction for me, whether it's a, a random concert goer in the middle of West Virginia, you know, who I just make an impromptu portrait of, to almost the exact same thing with Margot Robbie as Harley Quinn, right? And, and I'm not terribly interested if they're bad guys or if they're good guys. Uh, in natural light, both, by the way. So the idea here is that we're all, we all have cameras in our pockets, right? We, you, you may be sharing those images privately, but more than likely publicly. And the idea is to engage in this sort of wonderful, wonderful art form that is photography, this bizarre abstraction of our existence here and, our, and rendering of our world uh, in, a, in a frame. Professor Ewan's talk really gave me pause for a moment because I realized like we're in this continuum, right? Photography is a fairly new medium of expression for humanity and we are all now sort of gifted participation in it. And so be attentive and be, be mindful that you can be an artist. And so you pick up your camera, the first concern that you're going to have is science, right? Photons, light. Light is a kind of language that photographers sort of deal with. So when you have light like that, the magic hour we're all familiar with, uh, be it in Italy or in a little town with a population of seven, right? Or if it's just movie stars literally standing in an open doorway, right? They're standing in front of it, I'm standing in back. Or if I'm, turn it around, if I'm on the other side of the doorway facing them against a piece of foam core, right? It's the light that changes the mood. It's the light that is the photographer's concern. I, the, the camera, if it's a camera, is going to record light, right? I don't care if it's a fancy camera or if it's a, a, you know, an iPhone. The approaching storm, just being sensitive, that's an iPhone photo. So you can see that, that light is, is really the paramount concern, so to be sensitive to that. And when you're, when you're making photographs, that's the thing that's probably uh, something to really concern yourself with. The next would be composition, right? Composition is this bizarre thing that we carry around This almost works at a subconscious level. And I hate to sort of break it to, uh, to all of you, but composition works two ways. When you're making a composition, there's an impulse to kind of not follow the rules. But when we look at images, we then respond to ones that fit this bizarre rule of thirds. A, a Google image search presented me with that. You can read up on it. It's well worth understanding. The trick, though, is to make it part of your practice. The tendency is to make a photograph with the person in the middle. As soon as we look through and frame something, we tend to put it in the middle. We've all had the experience of uh, handing our camera to a friend or, or a stranger of the group shot. And there's this, just a ton of headspace, and, and our legs are cut off. There's, that's, that's a human thing whenever we're sort of framing and targeting. The stronger image, of course, follows the rule of thirds. Another example of that, and, and where composition's power, is it, this, was a, this was an image I made. These are former child soldiers in Congo who are now learning the skills of masonry as they reintroduce themselves to society. And this, in doing my edit, I was sort of quickly caught by this image for some reason. I couldn't quite place it. And then I, I sort of ran the, the aesthetic algorithm, and I was sort of shocked. And like, no wonder, right? This wasn't working. This was working on me at a level way beyond sort of personal taste. This, this is something that we should be aware of. It's in a bag of tricks. And, and to, uh, to, go, to go ahead with composition being part of our tool, in, another tool in our toolbox. The third tool might be to just go crazy. I mean, 
I'm in the wrong crowd, you know, the, the sort of hipster trap of shooting film nowadays. <laughs> I left that long behind. And to be fair, the, the professional photographer never cared about how many rolls of film they were shooting. You shot and shot and shot until you got it. Digital photographers now just enjoy that with abandon, right? And, and hipsters can too, I'm, it depends on your budget. You know, as an example of that, I woke up early one morning under the mosquito net and I, I sort of, I had some heavy thoughts and I was looking to sort of express that in just instead of, there was no internet and so I was making photographs instead of looking at them. It tends to be my, my default. And I did make a few that, that were sort of in the poetic space but only after breakfast did an image kind of reveal itself that sort of fit some of those, the, the niceties, and maybe my mood had changed, the light had changed. And, that, and that, that exploration is something that I would encourage, and it's very much part of, uh, you know, sort of a treat that we can all engage. A, a little personal project I have, and maybe a discipline that you can approach, is uh, if it's not pictures of your dick or your breasts. <laughs> I, I tend to, I walk across my street, I live on Fifth Avenue, and I just try and keep my chops up, right? Kind of always exploring this little breadth, the width and breadth of Fifth Avenue, all the time, every day. And, and there's, there's something healthy, I think, in sort of nurturing the muses, right? And it can be as mundane as crossing the street. That said, the, the last kind of collection of the toolbox are these, are these notions of timing, accidents, and, and as always, attention. The world of photography is fractions of a second. We, we could pretend, I could pretend that I'm some sort of genius and that I have, I have this uncanny ability to predict when something's gonna happen. But so many photographs are just that, accidents. Your hope you sh is, is to do just that, to hope, to will, to be lucky, to put yourself, to guess where it's gonna happen and then maybe it will, it will be there. But that's kind of fun. There's something sort of humbling and lovely about not being in total control. And photography, because it renders the world so beautifully, offers that. I mean, just a, a nice example is that that image that got released of Ben is an uncropped, unretouched photograph between takes and the black background over there. Uh, that's Ben Affleck, ba Batman, for those who don't know what's Ben. Sorry, I'm in, William, I'm in, I'm in Brooklyn. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right? So the internet, if you're on the internet, you think everybody knows who Batman is. Um, is just a piece of grip gear. And similarly, Jared Leto is the Joker just for a moment, like relaxed and stopped being the Joker almost and got a lovely, again, uncropped, unretouched image. So it can be, it can be in that sort of highly constructed context or out on the street where, where a random passerby and a billboard and a homeless guy or, or kids playing soccer with their plastic, plastic uh, soccer ball. That's as close as I get to sexting tonight, guys. I'm sorry. <laughs> Which is okay, Superman. Uh, you know, but be, being, having your camera, being ready, being aware, this is, a, this is like this magnificent thing. Every one of us has the ability to make an image that can inspire somebody else, change their perspective, change your own perspective. Uh, and, I, and with that sort of bag of tricks, I think you're in, you, we're in a good place. And finally, so that's in the actual making. This was a super dark image when I looked at it, but I knew there was more in it. And, and so when we go to the last little piece in this after part of the story, this idea is the biggest one to sort of bring to, audience, to the mass audience. To some extent, this is the domain that used to be prior to the app revolution, or Photoshop maybe, this was the exclusive domain of professional photographers, darkroom savants, the photo finisher. You bring your roll of film into the drugstore, and an hour later or a day later, you would get prints. You weren't aware that that image was being manipulated. They were taking those negatives and adjusting your photographs to try and make a reasonable print. They were paid by how many prints got actually exposed. So, so this, we're in a wonderful time these two apps are hands down all you need for 98% of your image making. The, the app on the left is free and the other one is virtually free with in-app purchases. And, and I would say I use 
Snapseed 98% of the time, and I use VSCO 5% of the time. Well, well worth it. The trick here is to not overdo it. Because we are in a time when this is the latest piece of the technological revolution, this is the place where it's so easy to overdo it, all I have to do is slide that filter and it comes to a place I've never experienced. The real trick here is to, you need to feel it. Not every context like that, which is in fact became that, right? The temptation is to say, oh yeah, I can take this and make that in my phone. Probably not. <laughs> It'd be cool though, I mean, because that is what happened, somebody did it. But the, for us, for all of us, without, without troops and, and teams of art directors, there's the same, if you understand those compositional rules, if you understand the way the light is talking to you, and we're all sensitive to it. We, we've played with Instagram filters. We know that by running one filter over another, the photograph changes how it feels. Settle down, feel it, and I think you'll be in a better place. The, it, these are the, this is the big question. How, how are we a documentarian who is telling a story uh, that where, where the unadulterated truth is going to convert or tell the story? Or are we allowing ourselves a place to really play and express ourselves and, and explore artistically? But I, I have some recent iPhone photos. This is all done with Snapseed or VSCO. There's never anything else. And you can, there's always choices to make. Uh, when I only shared the one on the right, and people thought it was fake or just crazy, but, but look, that's the real thing. So sometimes reality is pretty bizarre. Similarly, uh, can you tell I was just in Mexico? The photo from the phone isn't finished, right? And, and you can finish it, and you should enjoy finishing it. Similarly, uh, this is in Lake Kivu between Rwanda and Congo, and just taking a splash of water and giving it a kind of permanence that I, that I appreciated. Killing time more than anything else. So some clouds on approach that can become a more poetic look at the exact same thing. This isn't the work of a magician. This is, a, this is Yosemite National Park, which might be some sort of divine magician. And then just having some fun and evoking the vintage postcards I, I sort of grew up seeing. We've all seen them, right? That's a, that's a photographer's dream, that place. Also a place where it's slightly intimidating knowing that Ansel Adams kind of cut his teeth there to try and make images with your iPhone. <laughs> but man, I was happy with that. The Grand Canyon, another place, you probably, hard to make an original image, but just as proof, I mean, this nothing, the, the photo is probably in there, and the power for you to bring it out is the thing that so many photographers, or, or all of us with our cameras, fail to do, and I would encourage you to do so. And lastly, given the nature of tonight's uh, theme, is, is sharing, right? We live in where the consequences of sharing, I, when I was in college, the idea of showing my work to more than 15 people was an impossibility. I was never gonna be accepted into some, you know, Soho gallery, and the local coffee shop wouldn't even see my stuff. But now, the planet is our audience, potentially, and so I would just be really mindful, especially if there's people in your photographs, of the consequences and the undoubted, unintended consequences. Right, because boy, oh boy, not, not every image you make is going to end up in that. I was thinking that maybe newspaper photographers have their work thrown out more than me, but this, this might have rivaled it. <laughs> At least they're, we're all recycled to some extent. And finally, you know, it, it's, it's a, there's the last little piece in the social network space that I've found. The Instagram and Facebook, the seduction of likes is so, so strong. There is a new social network out there. It doesn't have advertising. It doesn't data mine. Um, I would encourage photographers and folks, there's, a, there's a levels of intimacy available there. That I, that's where I tend to share most of my work. But that, that seduction of likes is something that I, I bet Professor Ewan would have insights into. I, I don't quite have them, but I feel them. Uh, I would say that you should you should be honoring yourself and your work more and not just being sort of fodder for another ad-based platform. <laughs> but that's... <laughs> anyway, I hope, I hope tonight was, that was somewhat revealing of my process, but also for you.